So our um, next speaker is, um, I gave a brief introduction to uh, Stephanie Olson before. She is from the Children's Hospital of Colorado where she is, her title is Family Consultant. That's just a lovely title. Um, and she will explain more about what that is. Um, she just flew in from St. Petersburg, Russia. So um, she may be a little jet lagged, but uh, she is so gracious to come and talk to us today and I'm very excited. Thank you, it's great to be here today. Um, a, li a little note about um, my PowerPoint has a lot of words on it, and you don't have to pay attention to all of them, but I'm kind of one of those information junkies, so I like to go back home and read through the PowerPoints and connect them with what I've heard, so that's part of why I do it. And I also do that because I travel and present um, internationally, and sometimes there's a little bit of a language barrier or breakdown, and I am also concerned if people are um, able to understand me, so it kind of backs me up that way. But don't worry, I won't read every single thing. I have confidence in your reading skills. <laughs> so, um, this is where it began. This is actually a picture of me with my mother and my father, and um, I love looking at this photo. Um, my dad passed away about 10 years ago, so I love seeing um, him and his smile. And then, of course, there's my mother, who's also here today. She's right over there. And if you'll notice, <laughs> isn't that great? Yay, yay for parents. One of the things I want you to notice on this photo is uh, my mom's red lips, and she has lipstick on right now. <laughs> and I always say that this has a lot to do with um, my development of speech and language because those big red lips were moving all the time. <laughs> and because we're here to talk about early intervention today, when I look at this photo, there's something in it that takes my breath away, and that is the fact that my hearing loss wasn't discovered until I was three years old. So I keep staring at that little bitty baby, that little cute picture of me, and wondering what those first three years of language and hearing and learning, what was going on. Very interesting for me, and that's why I find the studies that Mary Pat Moeller is doing and talking about our forgotten children so powerful because I am a product of um, that generation where I wasn't identified. And I know this isn't a great comfort to families, um, parents here today whose child has been identified with a hearing loss right after um, birth with the newborn screening, because um, that's something you weren't expecting. It was just, it just wasn't for most parents even in the realm of thinking. And a lot of times, the baby books that we read the first um, nine months, so what to expect when you're expecting, don't even talk about newborn hearing screening, unless that's changed, because my kids are older. That's something I need to look into. But um, that's why I am so passionate about early intervention. I was identified with severe to profound, and I think at the time it was probably moderate to severe, and then later on became severe to profound hearing loss. And then fit it with very powerful hearing aids. The reason um, that I was even identified was that my mom noticed that I was not developing speech and language, and that at times I would turn her face towards her to get the information that she was giving me. And then I did get a cochlear implant in 2006, so that would be about nine years ago. And um, that was an interesting process, and I'm glad I did it. It was a good thing, it was a great decision for me. I understand it's not for everybody, but it was a good decision. I will tell you though, as a person that grew up with hearing aids, I still really liked my hearing aid for a long time. I always say it's like your first boyfriend or maybe your first kiss, you know? <laughs> There's, there's many other wonderful things coming, but that first time is so great, and my hearing aids gave me a lot of good residual hearing, a lot of uh, very powerful um, 
uh, low de deep bass sounds, and I love that, which is also why I'm still a fan of good old-fashioned rock and roll music. <laughs> Um, the information, options, and support for my parents were not available, and I think that's part of what uh, made um, the journey through hearing loss for my parents a little bit more difficult than today's families. And it is also why my role at the hospital is one that I take very seriously, because I understand if we get the information to our parents and families from the beginning that their process, it's not that it's going to be better, but the support will guide them into good decision making. I attended public school, had many, many, many years of uh, speech therapy, and I didn't like it. I was pretty much a good girl. I wasn't one of those naughty kids that was out in the parking lot smoking or anything, but I did hide from the speech therapist. <laughs> in the bathroom, with my legs up on the toilet seat. <laughs> um, one of the most powerful things that happened to me growing up was I had the opportunity to attend a camp, Camp Courage in Minnesota, for deaf and hard of hearing. Yay, somebody knows about it. Ooh. Awesome. Yes, I was too. Isn't it wonderful? It was fantastic. That was my first um, glimpse into deaf and hard of hearing kids and services and everything under the sun. It was amazing. I was the only one at my school, so I had no idea that there were so many other people out there. And that's another reason why I'm in such um, support of deaf and hard of hearing mentors or role models for families and children because it makes a big difference in their life. I did learn sign language in college and then um, continued to learn it as an adult. And um, it's kind of a joke. I work at Children's Hospital Colorado. And uh, in fact, one of my colleagues, my former colleagues is here. And it was always kind of a joke that the hearing people were much better at sign language than the deaf and hard of hearing person. But they, 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 they did a good job with it. And I just kept trying to you know, get better and better. But I don't know. I have a teaching background. I graduated from college in with a degree in special ed and social work. And then I worked for the Colorado Home Early Intervention Program for about 15 years. I serve on the Hands and Voices Board for Colorado and headquarters. I also work as a deaf and hard of hearing mentor and guide. And that's a little bit about me. I wish that could just be the end of the presentation, but there's more. <laughs> there's more. But I kind of like the audience to know about me because I found out when I first started presenting that the audiologists and speech therapists were really working hard to figure out what my audiogram was like, what technology <laughs> was I wearing. So you can stop thinking about that. <laughs> One of the things that I do at Children's Hospital Colorado is to serve as a family consultant. It was very interesting when I was first hired and introduced to the ENT docs, and they said, are you a speech pathologist? I said, oh, no, no. Are you an audiologist? No, not at all. Social worker? No. And they kept going through everything, and then finally the one doctor said, well, then what are you doing here? I like, I have no idea, <laughs> but I'm going to make this work. And it was kind of a job that was um, created when our, pro our program received a grant, and um, our director um, of services looked at the, the program and thought, how can we better support families? And it was decided that we would bring in somebody that has that first-hand experience of hearing loss and work along the professionals and support families as needed. So the biggest thing that I do is serve as a liaison between the clinical staff and the families in the hospital. I uh, connect with the families shortly after identification Sometimes I'm there at that moment, and I'll come in and talk to the families, just briefly introduce myself, because I know they need some time to absorb that information. And I work very hard to help the families get to a point where they are valued members of our community at the hospital, that we value their input, input we value their feedback, and that they need to be considered as a viable, most important part of the, of the team. And I work to kind of make sure the communication between 
all of the providers and the families. It's nice and fluid and that people are seeing that each other's questions, concerns, and needs are being met because then we have a very powerful treatment team for the child. One of the things that's really difficult is shortly after identification is um, the family's focus so much on what is not right, what is not working, what the hearing loss is, what their child can't hear. And I also work to help the families try to find um, what their child's doing well. And, and that's kind of difficult because all they can think about is that audiogram and the news that they've just been told. So we'll talk about the child's daily life and what they're doing and the babies and their little developmental milestones that they're meeting, they're meeting and make sure that we bring that into every part of the appointment. And I also let the team members and the doctors know when they do a good job. And um, that sounds so kind of, um, what? But you know, sometimes they're busy and they're going quite you know, fast and they have a lot of families to see. And when they do a great job with the family, they need to know that they've done you know, well with connecting. And that just helps that process keep going. And then of course I lend a personal perspective just into the day-to-day -day life um, with living with the hearing loss. Sometimes families and clinicians have said, but we don't have a big team. We're in, we're in a rural area or we're a small facility. We're not a big hospital. And so it's nice to take a look at all the possibilities on the team. And of, of course, the most important members of that team would be the child and the family. And for those families that are in rural areas or outside of a major city, I just ask them to consider and talk about who's on their team. And it might be a grandpa or grandma, it might be a neighbor, it might be their best friend, and then we can look at um, who's involved with the family. And these are just um, uh, some of the people that we have working at the hospital that sometimes come in and serve um, as a good support for the family system. We've brought in a uh, child life specialist and they usually work in the inpatient part of the hospital for kids that might be undergoing um, um, complicated medical procedures, but we've used them in the clinic with our families to play with the kids, because you know those appointments get long, and we have to sit in the booth a lot and go through many appointments, and they have just creative ideas, so I like to throw that out. We're very fortunate that we also have a deaf educator on staff that will start talking to families about early intervention services, school services, and I wanted to point out we have a chaplain, and um, he has, um, he actually has ushers, and he's, he's doing quite well. He has a cochlear implant in one ear, hearing aid in the other <laughs> ear, and some vision issues, and he's been incredible with our families. And so that was just an example of just kind of opening up the community and looking who's out, looking and seeing who's out there that can serve as support besides the audiologist and speech pathologist. They, those are great people. For those of you that are in the audience, I'm not saying that's not enough, but I know for a fact that you have limited time in your appointments, and families have so many questions. And I also know for a fact that many times the audiologists come back into the office and they go over and over of um, all the things that they could have done or should have done and they ran out of time and making phone calls. So we just want to look at better ways to support the whole team. I like to talk about babies first and then the hearing loss second because that seems to be one of the things that gets taken away from families or they feel like they've lost and all that they can do is focus on that hearing loss and I remind them that they still have that beautiful little baby in their arms and that is so important. I'll frequently follow up with the families um, after they leave the clinic, and I had this happen over a uh, Fourth of July holiday weekend, and I checked in, and the mom was having such a difficult time, she couldn't even talk to me on the phone, so the dad got on, and he explained that it was difficult, and we chatted a little bit with a diagnosis of the hearing loss that just really, just, you know, had impacted the family. And then I said, so what are your plans for this holiday weekend? And he says, you know, we haven't even thought about that. And I knew they had other, um, children in the family, so I, I was interested in what they were going to be doing. And I said, you know, we're going to give you a lot of good support and 
you know, be there and help back you up. But if you can, try to have a little fun that week, you know, over the holiday weekend. That's so important. It's good for your kids. And it's also good just to take your baby out and, you know, enjoy that weekend. And I found out several years later, he said that was the best advice I had ever received. He said, we just stopped. And in that moment, it was so difficult for us to take that next step. And he says, you know what, we had the best weekend. It was so great. And I want you as providers out there to remember to offer that to families. For parents in the audience, we are passionate, as you heard from Mary Pat's presentation, as speech pathologists, audiologists, doctors, people that work in the field of hearing loss, we are so passionate about the outcomes for our children that sometimes it might feel like you're gonna end up becoming a, a professional too. Don't ever lose the fact that first and foremost, you have the most important role as a mother or father, because you know what, you can, Go through life and have many speech pathologists and audiologists involved in your child's life, but they're only going to have that one mother or father, and they need you for that. Early intervention, families, the hearing aids, the technology, the language, the options, the choices, modality, Everything is so important, but we also need to take a look at our families and their basic life needs and what else is going on in that family. We've had families that are in very difficult situations, and quite frankly, keeping hearing aids on isn't always the first goal. I had a mom say to me, you know what, I really can't keep these hearing aids on my baby if I stand there just like this <laughs> in front of her, and I don't do the laundry, and I don't take care of my other kids, and nothing else gets done that day. And if you've gone through this with your own child, isn't it stunning how fast and quick they are? How can they move that quickly and pull that hearing aid out and pop it in their mouth? And you're this far away, it's amazing. But we do wanna take a look at the family life and see how that's going with the hearing aids. A lot of families have multiple therapies and appointments. Let's talk about that as professionals with the families and see where we can fit in and support them. One of the most important things is families' voices and opinions are valued in this system. They don't know that yet. And I loved your story about putting the kids' pictures on the Newsweek or Time Magazine because um, those children in this study are having a great impact on language outcomes and parents I may not be fully aware of that. And everything that we do for our families, we cannot do it without our families. When you look at the appointments that take place in speech or audiology, what do the families bring to the visit? A variety of emotions, as you can see, and I'm not gonna go through all of these. I'll just touch on um, a few of them, but one of the, um, Interesting things that came last week when we were um, visiting with families with children who have hearing loss in St. Petersburg was um, a mom, a, a mom, a Russian mom, who was talking about the uh, diagnosis of her child's hearing loss and what they were doing and then her connection with other parents and other adults that had hearing loss. And she said, I felt like I could breathe. And to me, that is such a powerful statement. Is what can we do in these appointments when the families come in with so much on their plate to help them feel that they can breathe? Addressing a lot of the emotions are important, but it's easy for us as professionals to look at the grief cycle and where families are, and not all the families will go through that. Sometimes that grief cycle may not take place until later years, like preschool or early elementary years. Some families are just relieved that it's not something worse. And some families are so open and they want to try everything and do everything possible for their child. But sometimes professionals want to slow them down and take a look at that grief cycle and find out why they're not crying. We just need to take the families where they're at. And if there is a family that is in pain, we don't need to fix that pain, 
but we just need to feel it and sit with them side by side and let them share what they're willing to share with us. And if we have parents in here, do we have some family, some parents? You have this brand new baby and um, that in itself is overwhelming. And then the involvement of all these professionals in your life, was that difficult, was that hard? All these people, did you ever feel like you just needed to put a revolving door in for your front door and people just keep coming and going and coming and going? And that's hard in the beginning, but I always tell families, I can promise you it will get better. You will get to a point where there'll be a nice routine, but in those beginning stages, we do have that tendency to overwhelm our families because we want to make sure that we get off to a good start with providing services and support. I think it's important that we take a look at the whole family, that siblings are an important part of this process. Siblings that come into the appointment spend a lot of time waiting, a lot of time, and they're not always sure what's going on. One of the things that I am I'm working with our team on is when the mother, it's usually the mother, Sometimes the dad, but it's usually the mother starts crying during the appointment and nobody acknowledges it. And I'll look over at the older brother or sister and I'll say, you watching your mom cry? And they'll be like this and their eyes are so big and I'll say, you know what? Sometimes moms just cry. Like sometimes they cry when they're sad or sometimes they cry just because they're worried or sometimes they cry when they're happy. Did your mom ever do that? And these kids nod. And I'll say, it's okay. I said, we're going to give your mom some tissues, and it's okay. She can cry, and you can keep playing with your toys, and they're so relieved. We have to acknowledge that with our families. I love working with the siblings. That's my most favorite part of the appointment. So I should say my second most favorite part. Of the first part is, of course, the uh, child with hearing loss. But they're so fun, and also, they're there for that one hour appointment, but with us for that one hour appointment, but when they go home, they have all those other hours to fill with their sibling. And if we can help them be a part of that appointment, it's so neat to see what they take home with them. I had the opportunity to work in the hospital with the family that was also a family that I worked with for early intervention. And one day I was at the home and we're playing and the little brother was so cute. And um, he said, um, he had been at the audiology appointment and all of a sudden we're playing and he said, back up, back up, bop, 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 one, two, three, one, two, three. And I was like, oh my goodness. He copied the audiologist when she was just checking. Oh my goodness, it was so wonderful. So wonderful, very good. One of the beauties of working with the siblings and the family is that, of course, the siblings, is, they have a relationship that's going to most likely outlast the parents because just, you know, kind of the way it goes, but kind of the way it goes. But they're there for so many years and so much of what the siblings do, um, the kids with hearing loss are able to learn from. That is where I learned, right down here, you see in the corner, that's my brother, and then I'm in the middle, of course, and then there's my little sister. And um, if you notice, I have a little Mary Poppins bag, <laughs> and inside that Mary Poppins bag was a salamander. <laughs> we used to have salamanders in the window wells, and we would collect them, and then I would just put them in my Mary Poppins bag. <laughs> It has nothing to do with hearing loss. I'm just amazed that I did that. But what's so interesting is we learn so much from our siblings. That is where we also learn um, like the language that the kids use um, is so different. The kids you know, pick up words and phrases in preschool or school, and there's a lot to be said for that. And a lot of that is just something that I would have missed had it not been for my brother and my sister, and also the way that they navigate their life. We are three completely different people. The way that we go through life is completely different, but 
I learned a lot from watching them as an older child, watching how they do things and get things, and there's so much um, to be gained from. And also, it's all the power and play. The vast amount of time that I spent playing with my siblings, and they were my best playmates for many, many years, is where I was able to get a nice, strong foundation of language. And the siblings are great, especially if you have the babies with trying on hearing aids. Or, um, the only way that my parents could get me to um, stop crying when I had to get the ear mold made was that they would have my brother go first. And then they would put that pink goo in his ear, and then it was my turn. So a lot of good role modeling, and especially with babies, you can ask the siblings, what color should we get? What color ear molds should we get? What color hearing aids? And make them a big part of that appointment. We do a family camp in the summertime, and um, we um, have a sibling session, and most of the siblings talk about the benefits of their sibling with hearing loss. I thought they were gonna really wanna sit down and share how difficult it is to have a brother or sister with hearing loss. That wasn't something that they were interested in. They wanted to talk about the good things. One thing came up is um, all the therapies and appointments. So this little girl said, so a lot of times when we get home from those appointments, my mom is so tired, so we just get to watch TV. So because my brother has hearing aids, I get a lot more screen time. <laughs> Almost every sibling shared the time that they have to hunt for hearing aids, missing hearing aids, lost hearing aids. And you know, the ones that made $5 because they found the hearing aids. <laughs> So in the early years, we want to talk about the language and the communication that occurs outside of your audiology appointment or the speech and language or the early intervention moment. These are the places where the foundation for self-worth are created. So it is so important to look at the daycare situations as uh, providers, professionals, preschool, places of worship, the car, Mary Pat talked about that. That's a difficult place to have a lot of conversation. And things change in the car. You jump in the car, you're going to Target, and wouldn't you know, there's three or four more stops before you get to Target. And the kid with hearing loss didn't realize all that was happening because those conversations are taking place in the car. Very important to take a look at the car, especially in today's society and the amount of time that we spend commuting. Holidays are really difficult for the little ones with hearing loss. So many conversations happen and take place during the holidays. A lot of um, connections, um, understanding the family dynamics. I've talked with kids that don't realize that their aunt is their dad's sister. We don't really teach our kids that. That is information that we just kind of pick up. And these kids need to be aware of that. And the traditions or the rituals that you have in your family and why you do what you do is so important that you share that with our kids with hearing loss. From the time that they're little, it starts in the very beginning. Activities um, that the family uh, participates in and just the overall family life is very important. I always like to talk about um, the vocabulary connected with the places of worship. Like the most bizarre vocabulary, like you sit down in a pew. <laughs> Very interesting, there's a lot of that. It's also important to finish your stories when you tell a story um, about something that's happening um, if with the church or, um, I'll give you an example with a student that was trying to understand Lent and I finally understood what she was talking about. The only problem was she thought it was still Lent and she could not eat meat and it was July. Somebody <laughs> forgot Somebody forgot to tell her that Lent was over. If you share these stories with your children with hearing loss, it's very important that you finish your stories. <laughs> Taking a look at the parent perspectives and what comes up in our families, 
And I think a lot of you can recognize these. Um, one thing that was really um, interesting when I went back and talked to families that I um, had seen at the hospital and through early intervention and asked them to take a look back to their early intervention years and their perspective is the providers have different goals for a child. Shared goals would be nice. So that's really important with that team collaboration and including all the members in your team. Just a few parent perspectives. Consistent and effective communication is a challenge. And this is so important for children with hearing loss because it looks like they're hearing everything and they're not. How can we have consistent and effective communication through the whole day? When you're out in the community, that is very important. Progressive hearing loss. I really want to talk about this for a minute because I think that we are doing a better job of following these kids. And um, this is something that makes parents sit on the edge of their seat when they go in. They don't want the hearing loss to get worse. Nobody does. I don't want mine to get worse either. But sometimes it happens. Sometimes it happens. And as the child gets older, the pressure to do well inside the booth really is difficult when there is a hearing loss that might be progressive. I had the opportunity to work with a little girl and she did have a progressive hearing loss and it was difficult for her family. And she was in the booth and I was out with the mom and the audiologist and we could see that it wasn't going as the mom had hoped. And she did such a beautiful job when Janelle once came skipping out after the appointment she had long, beautiful brown hair. She came skipping out of the booth and she said, I did a great job. And her mom looked, looked at her and she said, you really did. And you know what she did? She sat there and she waited patiently and she raised her hand for those beeps and she repeated back all those words. She did do a good job. Her hearing loss is not the same as it was, but she did such a good job. And we need to continue to acknowledge the work that our families, our mothers and fathers do when the kids go, when they take their babies into the booth for their audiology um, test. And I always say it was difficult for me growing up because every time I went in that booth, I wanted to do better. And quite frankly, that wasn't going to happen. But um, I just thought this time I could do it if I just listen really hard. I'll pass, so sometimes I would pray, and maybe this time would be the miracle, the ultimate miracle. And it's so hard to keep going in for those tests when it's something that you're not gonna do well. Because I don't think there's anybody here that consistently goes back and does something over and over and over that they don't do well, or in my case, pretty much fail at. So what can you do? You need, you need to have a good, positive way to address those appointments, Think about the language that you're using. If you need to talk with the parents and give them some good phrases to use when their child comes out of the booth. And especially um, with the babies, you know those parents are going through multiple hearing tests. And we talk about um, what they're doing well, the way that they're turning and looking to the sound. There's so many good things that we want to capitalize on. This came up over and over from the parents that I would talk to, is that people tend to underestimate my child. And that's a concern to me. I don't know that it's always the professionals, but I think it's also the people that are in the family's day-to-day -day life. And how can we increase the expectations that we have for our children and make sure that they're always able to hear what the other little babies and children are hearing? Involving deaf and hard of hearing professionals is very important. It's good for the family, but it's good for the kid. I will frequently take off either my hearing aid or my cochlear implant and show it, even to a baby, and they'll reach for it. And I always think, oh, I hope it's okay, but I do work at a hospital, so there's always a good backup if something were to happen. <laughs> but they're so interested. And then I take my hearing aid and I put it back on my ear, and those little babies are watching. The funny thing is I do this like multiple times throughout the years. And one time I was with this little boy 
and he was about three and a half, four years old, and I showed him my hearing aid, and he looked at his dad and he went, hey, look at her, she has one too. And I was like, I've been showing you this since you were six months old. But I think that repetition is so important and that identification for those little kids to find out there are other people out there with hearing aids. One of the things that we tend to do with our deaf and hard of hearing professionals is wait until the family's in crisis or when things aren't going well or perhaps the child is not making progress and then we decide to connect them with a deaf and hard of hearing professional. And I enjoy meeting and connecting with families before things might not be going well because I can establish a relationship with the family and child and get to know get to know them. And then when it's time to um, work on something that the child or the family might be having difficult with, it's so much easier because we have a relationship. And we all know that things go better when there's an established relationship with the family. The hardest people to get on board with this was sometimes the professionals. I would go into work and check the schedule and see who was coming in to the hospital today which families you know, had children with hearing loss, or maybe it was somebody that I hadn't had the opportunity to meet. And then I would check in with the audiologist and they would frequently say, oh, she's doing well, the family's doing great, they're connected with all the services, the uh, little one's wearing her hearing aids um, you know, for all waking hours, and everything's really good. And that's when I say, great, because that's when I want to meet the family. So it was a good thing to keep in mind when you're working with deaf and hard of hearing mentors that we don't have to save it up for when things don't go well. A lot of what I do is just answer families' questions. And I always say, you can ask me anything. My life's an open book. And then one day I paid for it. <laughs> I had a mother, a mother with a one-year-old little boy, beautiful little boy. And I said at the end of the audiology appointment, do you have any questions? Is there anything that I can help you with? And she said, yes. And they always wait until the audiologist or the speech pathologist or doctor you know, um, leaves the room. And then I'm like, but she said, um, um, yes, I do have a question. I was just wondering, you know, as a deaf and hard of hearing person, um, like, what do you do? Like, how are you intimate? at night, <laughs> like how can you see, you know, at night if you wanted, you know, to be intimate with your husband. This is terrible. I just realized my husband's sitting there. I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. Yeah. Whoops. But anyways, so I was so amazed. The good thing was I had an audiology student there and I knew that I had heard correctly because for a brief moment I thought I must not have heard that right. <laughs> And I looked over at her and she was bright red. <laughs> and I looked right at the uh, mom and I said, you know, um, we do it the same way you do. <laughs> and uh, the poor dad was so embarrassed. The poor father was so embarrassed. And I said, you know what I think you're asking me is who is your child going to be with someday? Who's your child going to fall in love with? And she nodded her head. Because that question has come up before. Does my daughter have to marry a deaf person, a hard of hearing person, or a hearing person? And my answer to that, to that is that your daughter or your son will marry or spend the life, their life with whoever he or she falls in love with. And then they're so relieved. So <laughs> very good to give families the opportunities to ask those questions that are way deep down inside. Because it's a long time if we wait until that family waits until the child gets to that part of their life for them to get those issues addressed, even though that little baby was only one year old. And um, that's something that they were wondering about. It certainly wasn't something that um, most of us are thinking about as professionals, but giving families that opportunity to answer questions, ask questions and get the answers from a person that walks that walk is really important. So we'll take a little change here. 
there's a great little story. I, it's, I don't think it's true. I Googled it and tried to find out, but it still fits with where I'm going. But the man on the moon story, have you heard of it before? Is it familiar to? Yeah, so during a visit to the Space Center in 1962, President Kennedy noticed a janitor carrying a broom and he interrupted his tour, walked over to the man and said, hi, I'm Jack Kennedy, what are you doing? And the man said, well, Mr. President, the janitor responded, I'm helping put man on the moon. So what are we doing? We're going to put a deaf and hard of hearing child on the moon. We really are. Do you believe that? You should. You should. You really should as parents and professionals and providers for families. When you look at those little itty bitty babies, you should believe that we're going to have a deaf and hard of hearing child on the moon. It won't be me, though. <laughs> <laughs> I have no interest. But. <laughs> That's a big part of what I also talk about. In order for our children to succeed and do well in life, we need to look beyond their hearing loss. We need to look at their personalities and all that they have to offer and make that um, known to the family because sometimes it's so hard to see outside of that audiogram or outside of the hearing aids that are on that child. So this is going to be a great goal that we're all going to work on. And taking a look back and answering the question of what I wish I knew then that I know now. And there's my family again, there's my mom. And doesn't she look like Jackie Kennedy? <laughs> I think so. And there's my sister, my brother, and there I am. And this is a classic picture of a deaf and hard of hearing child, a child with hearing loss. Because we're usually not looking at the camera I show this to other deaf and hard of hearing friends and they laugh and laugh. It's like, oh my gosh, we have so many family pictures where I'm looking the wrong way. <laughs> Very important when you get that camera out and you're taking pictures of your kids that have hearing loss to, you know, put your hand up and do the one, two, three, or ready, and then snap. And so we can find the, you know, that right moment and smile. So anyways, um, I am um, listening. My mom is in the um, the first one, and then I'm in the second one. So it's like my mom said, "I wish I had known that children with hearing loss could become whatever they set their minds to." And then my response to that question was, "I wish, I wish I knew. Whoops! I wish I knew that my life would be full of options and potential that I could not have possibly imagined when I was growing up." And I just didn't have that next step. And a lot of that was there weren't a lot of deaf and hard of hearing professionals or mentors in my life. Just a few, and it was enough. But I didn't have a lot of it to even be able to imagine what the possibilities were for myself. And then my mom said she wished she had known that a cochlear implant would become a reality. And I had a real difficult time when I made the decision to go from hearing aids to cochlear implant. Um, and I doubted my decision, and I even woke up in the middle of the night the night before surgery and said to my husband, I think I'm making a mistake. And he said, no, 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 go back to sleep. We'll talk about it in the morning. And I did get up and get in the car and go for my uh, surgery, but that was because I was too embarrassed to go back to work and tell everybody that I chickened out. <laughs> But what was so important for me, regardless of your child technology, is that it's not going to change who you are. And I wish I had the confidence to know that it was going to change what I hear, but it wasn't going to change who I am. And then, of course, my mom says she wished she could have known and realized that I would become who I am today. And then I said, thank you, mom. I wish I knew then that being angry at you for, being worry, for worrying about me wasn't fair to either one of us. And I think I always sense how worried my mom was about me and my dad. But, um, and I got mad at her because I was confident in myself. I don't know where I got that confidence from. But I knew that <laughs> things were going to be OK. And I was going to keep working and figure out where I was going to go in life. And I ended up in so many different places. But we have to install that confidence in our children with hearing loss 
as providers, you have such an important role. And I know I kind of made fun of the speech pathologist, and I really am grateful for all the work that you've done. <laughs> truly, I truly am. But you have such a, an impact on the children that you work with and the audiologist. You do so much to give that confidence to the families and the children. And I'm so grateful for all of you for being here today. Thank you very much. What did I do? Am I okay with the time? Thank you for that awesome talk. Um, we're gonna t Stephanie's gonna talk again this afternoon and we're gonna have a panel discussion. Um, so we want to make sure everybody has enough time for lunch. So we'll, we'll skip questions right now.